When does the class end? Um, 47. Okay. 47. 147. Okay. <laughs> Better hurry. Yeah, I've, got, I've got all a bunch of content here that I got to cover here. So you guys will watch this. Uh, anyway, uh, I was asked to present uh, a, a, an economic update of what's going on right now, current events. So it's very timely. So we're going to talk about that today, as well as some other stuff. But uh, it's all pictures. I think I got 52 slides. So let's go through that, and uh, we'll discuss what uh, what all that all this means. Okay, and why things are happening the way that they are. All right. Okay. So here's the obligatory chart on GDP. Okay, quarterly going back to 2008, all the way through the end of uh, the, the latest year. We don't have first quarter yet. It should be out sometime this month, first, first numbers. But uh, that's what it looks like. I mean, it's kind of a boring chart, not anything exciting. But we've had 18 quarters, of, of except for one, of positive growth. Okay, four and a half years of 18 quarter positive growth, except for that one blip. Um, and it's averaged about uh, uh, two and a half percent. That's about what it's been averaging. Okay, so growth hasn't been stellar. Normally, growth per, uh, the long term average is around three, but since the uh, end of the recession, those last two bars, that, that's where the recession is, is still uh, happening, but we've got climbed out of that. But since the end of the recession, since the recovery, has occurred uh, about two and a half percent. So we've been sort of moderate to lower than average growth. Okay. But nevertheless, what's important is that it's positive growth. All right, positive growth. But then when, when you look at surveys, I've got a spinning ball. It might be this monitor. Yeah, I'm just froze. Uh, well, I'm not frozen. I've got a spinning beach ball. I'm waiting for that to decide if it does. And I can show you the next picture. Is it showing the screen? Yeah. I just rebooted, so uh, I should clear everything out. All right, how many uh, students is this representing your, of your, of your classes in AP Econ? Uh, just about half the first group. A bit larger, but the classes in the spring.
Okay, now we're back up. It doesn't do this again. Okay, so here's, uh, here, sorry, I was trying to get to before uh, computer problems, but uh, here's some surveys. I just showed you GDP, 18 consecutive quarters, except for one, with positive growth in the economy. But you know, when you ask people surveys, and this is a survey that's done by American Research Group, they do it every month, 500 households randomly. Is the economy still in recession? Okay. This is the no's. It's been rising. So no, the economy's not still in recession. But that's the yeses, all right? And so the no's and the yeses are almost neck and neck. So despite all the growth that we've had, even though it's been modest, a lot of people uh, are pessimists out there. You don't have an overwhelming, resounding uh, majority of people surveyed that think uh, that we're definitely out of recession. Okay, see they're about even over time. And this is March, this is recent data, March of 2014. Here, here's another one. How Americans rate the US economy. And bad to terrible is red. And of course, that's going down, which means it's not as bad as terrible as it used to be. And good to excellent is rising. But they're just, they just met in the middle. So again, pessimism seems to abound in America regarding the economy. A lot of it isn't known about it. It's still relatively slow. And people still believe the economy isn't great, okay, even though it's improving, needless to say. So that's kind of what I wanted to show you here is that uh, you tend to have these uh, conflicting measures of, comp of consumer sentiment. Here's the, the official consumer sentiment indices. This is one of the criteria that, one of the indexes that you'll see and you see reported in the media. So uh, the University of Michigan is the sentiment index in yellow. The conference board is the confidence index in blue. And they're rising. You see they took a big tumble there back in uh, 2008, 2009, but they're rising and now they're back up to about 80, 85. <coughs> Okay, and, and higher numbers mean that consumers are feeling a lot better about their situations, their employment prospects, their spending, okay, their household incomes. So it's rising, and that's all the way through March. So it's getting better, but it's very slow. Okay, so that's what those are. I like to use the Rasmussen Consumer Confidence Index because it's tracked daily. I was able to pull the numbers off today, April 11th. That's what the last bar is. Otherwise, the rest of them are months. So the last bar is April 11th today. The rest of our months, you can see that's been rising steadily throughout since the recession ended. So confidence is definitely improving. People are feeling a lot better, again, about their own particular economic situations. So that's what that means. Okay? So that's an important index for you to look at on a regular basis. Now, one of the more important ones is this, the financial markets. Okay? Look at any of the indices. This just happens to be the Dow. And it's the Dow through yesterday. Okay, and I go back to September, so about seven months, right? It's daily closings. So this is daily closings of the Dow. And, you know, it closed, it was down kind of sharply yesterday, but so what? It can be up sharply the same day. I, I forget where it was today, but it's not much different. Anyway, it's near or at an all-time record high. Okay, the all-time record high occurred, you know, right here, December. January, and we basically got up and, and matched that in late February, early March, and there's been some retracement a little bit here, uh, or late March, I should say. Uh, so uh, why is it that uh, the financial markets are so high? You know, when they're high, they forecast, that means they're for they forecast stronger growth for the economy. Why is that? Why are they doing that? What's prompting the Dow to be so exuberant you think it's a uh, 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 you think it's a fake out you think it's a false sense of security you think it's a full market that's been overdone you think it's a bubble what do you think do you even care <laughs> who watches the financial markets every now and then you guys yeah so you guys know about this Right, so the Dow's nearly at a record high, or real close to it. What what's driving the market? What makes it go higher? Hmm? Basically, earnings of firms that it comprises. And corporate profits are very very high. They're at all time record highs. So fourth quarter, 2013, the latest data I have 
It'll, it'll, the same thing will be first quarter, but it's all time record high profit. Profitability in the, in the economy is driving stock prices, earnings and firms. Okay, so that's what's high. Why is profitability so high? Come on, you challenge guys, you should know this. We're going to pass out some of the questions. Why is profitability so high? I'll stay at easing. Huh? What's that? I'll stay at easing. Well, quantitative easing may be, but there's a bigger, there's a broader answer to that. Low interest rates? That helps too. You know, but certainly the economy is now in an expansionary uh, uh, phase of the cycle, right? There's a lot of consumer purchasing. There's a, a, certainly a rebound overall in spending. Uh, and firms have gone on this crusade, particularly over the last five, six years, to do what? Improve efficiency. Improve efficiency by doing what? Uh, cutting their workforce. Cutting costs, and most of that is workforce. In fact, that's a key thing that I'm going to share with you today. They, instead of cutting, uh, they cut their workforce. And what do they spend it on? <laughs> hey, how did you know? <laughs> how did you know? <laughs> Good guess. The investment in technology here, the investment equipment and software, is at an all-time record high. In fact, look how much it's surged since the recession. The recession is that, that most recent dip, okay? So all-time record highs in firms investing, buying equipment and software, rather than spending it on labor, although they're spending it on that too. But we've seen a big surge here. So I'm gonna talk about this. This is important. So watch this going forward. This all, I'm putting this all together here. One of the things that it's spending on is this. What are these? What do these do? What's a semiconductor? Anyone know? Hmm? It's the heart. Heart ingredient of a what? Of a computer, yeah. Uh, but of a microprocessor. Silicone. You know, conducts electricity. Transistors. Semiconductors. They're the heart of the microprocessor. Microprocessors are in what? What are they in? They're, the answer is everything. They're in everything. They're in vacuum cleaners, hair dryers, lawnmowers. They're in everything. And they'll be in even more things. They're the mo becoming the most ubiquitous thing. Okay? And you can see how they, uh, here's the, the uh, production, semiconductor sales from U.S. manufacturers. All-time record high. Look at that, it tends to be a little seasonal, that's why it's going up and down, but all time record high. All right, everything is technology driven. Here, let me switch gears here for just for a second. I'm gonna come back to this. Here's auto and truck sales. Consumers are buying lots of cars. Look at, this is all time high for the, for the cycle since the recession, which is the March report was stellar. Okay, a lot of vehicle sales. It's an important indicator. It shows that consumers are spending on big ticket items. Durable goods too, and I'll get to that later. Okay, they're buying the fastest rates since the uh, Great Recession ended. What's the number one selling car in America? Toyota Camry. Toyota Camry, exactly. How do you know? I don't know. I'm just good at guessing, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Toyota Camry, made in Lexington, Kentucky. Where it's made. Okay. Here, retail sales in general, another big indicator, important indicator for consumption by consumers in the economy. Okay, it's uh, eclipsed its pre-recession levels. So it's, got, it's fought all the way back, it's recovered entirely, and now it's at all-time highs, although it's dipped in the last few months a little bit, even though car sales are up. Car sales are part of this, so uh, consumers are buying cars, but maybe they're holding off on some other things in the most recent months. But this is an important indicator, rising sharply and then dipping a little bit. And existing home sales, those rose sharply too. Okay, but you can see over the last, uh, oh, by the way, this was the, the incentive program during the Obama, early Obama administration, the stimulus. Uh, but you can see it's dipped over the last few months, home sales. So there's some concern about whether home 
the home uh, buying industry, the, the way their housing is going to uh, falter at all this year. Okay. Home price appreciation. Another important indicator. Okay, you can see it was all negative, which means housing prices were all going down all through this period. And then what's happened here recently, this is the last 24 months, that's 24 bars that you see on the right hand side that are all positive. So housing prices are all rising now again. So the housing market's really started to come back. There's been more buying, you know, prices rise when demand exceeds supply. Okay? And so that's what we're seeing here. Price being rising back up with the housing market coming back. So that's important. Here's the National Association of Home Builders, another index, market index, okay, for the Western United States. And you can see that that's at an all time high for the cycle, more or less. The index, as I show here, measures home builder confidence. Home builders, like KB Homes, all right, based on present sales that are going on now and expected sales that sellers, that the home builders will have because of all the traffic that they see at the new homes going through my people and calls and inquiries about what you have for sale and that kind of thing. So this is very, very high. So the index is rising. That means there's more interest, more buying potential. So that means we're going to see more new home sales. Housing starts are rising. They're not where they were. It's been a very slow, sluggish industry to come back. You see all the other charts I show you, they're all rising, they're all re eclipsed pre-recession levels. This one is not, not yet, slow. So new housing has been very sluggish, but it's coming back as you can see, slowly. Housing starts, okay, important indicator, because housing represents, you know, a major portion of investment, two thirds of investment. C plus I plus G, the I part, two thirds of that is housing, residential structures. Okay. Now here's job creation. Those are bars. Each bar is a month. Represents the total number of jobs created in that month. All right, through March of this year. Going back about four or five years. So in the last 48 months, they nearly all been positive. Just a few right over there. In fact, you know what that, those little negatives are right there? See, they occurred right after in April or May, June, July of 2010. That was, and you know what this big run up here before? So look at that big run up right before and look at that little decline after. You know what that was? Those are all the workers being hired for the US Census and then all of them being let go. Okay, the US Census was April of 2010. So if you just kind of like break off those top bars it's, and then neutralize or offset the lower bars, you really just have all nothing but positive growth. But because of that special event, we end up with this. But anyway, that's another story another time. We lost 8.8 uh, .8 million jobs during the recession. And you can see the recession just ending there. I didn't show it all, just show you the negative. And we've gained 8.3 million back. So we're not quite back to where we were, but we're getting there in a hurry. Okay, that's where we're on the job market. So jobs are being created. Unemployment rate's down to 6.7. Is that good or bad? It's a little high. That's exactly the right answer. It's a little high. It's a little high for where it should be at this point in time. And I'll show you why. Okay, but it's good. It actually, in fact, when you look at the world economy, here's, now, I just pulled this off the internet so you can't see it very well, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain. But the top line right there is the Eurozone. And then the bottom line below is all of Europe. You know, there's only like 17 countries that deal with the Euro. And then the rest of Europe has floating currency their own. And so that's the rest of Europe, right? And you can see the unemployment rates are pretty hot. For the Eurozone, 11.9% first quarter of this year. And for the rest, for all of Europe, it's about 10.6. So compare that to the U.S. It's pretty good, right? We're doing pretty good. Europe's been in recession through most of 2013. It's now coming out of it. It's doing better. All right? Here, here is uh, the, the, the 28 countries in that lower bar that I showed, the lower line. And you can see the Eurozone is the ones in dark blue. Okay? And then all the rest of them are the rest of Europe. All right? So the real bad countries are... Can you read these? Spain and Greece and Croatia, Cyprus, Portugal, 
Slovakia, Bulgaria. I mean, they're look at those unemployment rates. They're really high, right? So it just puts it in the Here's the U.S. rate. The U.S. rate is right there. So you can see the U.S. beats all these countries except for Malta, Czech, Luxembourg, Germany, and Austria. And then even those aren't that much different than the U.S., although Germany and Austria are significantly different. They're around 5, 4.9%. Okay, so that's where U.S. sits worldwide. It's doing pretty well. The economy is growing, okay, as far as employment anyway. But still, the unemployment rate is still too high. Here's California, 8.5. That's where we are right now. U.S. 6.7, California 8.5. Here, here's, here, here's kind of the, one of the theses I want to do today. Here's the unemployment rate in California. Okay, so there's the 8.5 right there that I just showed you, right? It's, it, it's, and the reason I have to, the, the things are, these are recessions underneath it. So that 8.5%, is the unemployment rate in February of 2014, and it happens to occur 57 months after the recession ended, the Great Recession of 2008-2009. When did that end? July of... July was the first month of growth, right. It ended in June. The last month was June, so the first month would have been July of growth. So if you start counting from July of 2009, to February 2014, you get 57 months. So 57 months after the recession ended, our employment rate is 8.5%. Now look at the previous three recessions. Those are the unemployment rates in California 57 months after those recessions ended. So what is this chart sort of asking? What question do you, do you want to ask because of this chart? <laughs> now, the question you want to ask very simply is, well, why? Why are we so much higher in this recession, after this recession, than those other three, the last three? Why? Anyone have any questions? Any uh, answers? Yes, you have all the answers. That's right. Well, does it have to do with the, uh, the uh, technology? It does. There's two reasons. <laughs> hey, he's three for three. Okay. Yeah, take a drink. Okay, on me. <laughs> All right. See, so there's the 81, 82, 90, 91, and 2001 recessions. The unemployment rate at this point in the same cycle, this point. So we're comparing oranges with oranges. Okay, why are we so much higher? Well, things are different today. Of course, you'll hear that phrase a lot of times, but they are different today. Okay, so here's the unemployment rate. By age, one of the reasons, the first of all, I said there were two reasons, two primary reasons. One first reason is demographics. There's too many of you guys. Look at that unemployment rate for 16 to 19 year olds 31%. Does that mean that you're counted in that rate? Are you counted in this rate? How many think you're counted in this rate? You do. Anyone else? No one? Why don't you think you're counting in the rate? Are you looking for a job? Do you have a job? You don't have a job. Then why aren't you in here? Because you're not looking. Exactly. That's the answer. You're one for one. That's right. You're, none of you are in this rate unless you, unless you, you answer yes to uh, when they call you up on the survey. Yeah, I'm looking for a job. I want to get the hell out of school. Okay, I'm 16, so I don't have to go anymore. And uh, I'm looking for a job, but uh, since I can't get one, I'm in school. If you answered that way, then they'd count. But since none of you are probably answering that way, then you're not in this rate. So this is only the people that are looking for the job, right? Okay, so 31, 30 point, and then 20 to 24 is just really high. And it is until 25 to, you know, here, let me go back, 25 to 34 that it starts getting down there. 34, I didn't show, I should have showed 35 and on, it's like 4%. Okay. It's like, a little, so it's just full. It's essentially full. So it, the problem with the unemployment rate is your age group. And of course, all the way up to 24. So I'm putting the blame on you guys. There's too many of you. All right. 
Here. Here's population age 16 to 24 in California. Right? And then the white bars are the forecast. So we had an all time record high. All time high historically in California. Too many of 16 and 24 year olds. Right? So we need to take like well, the whole bunch of you out and shoot you. And then uh, we won't, well, then a play rate will fall. <laughs> Significantly. Well, that's kind of good coding. We wouldn't do that. But, uh, uh, but, that, but the unemployment would fall if we did that. So demographics is uh, one of the issues. Is there's, there, there's a huge wave. It just so happens, it's coincidental, that right now at this point in time, there's a huge wave of you, the offspring of the baby boomers, which was by, in and of itself the largest ge generation ever in the history of the world. So your parents uh, were, uh, were the largest generation ever, and uh, now you're the second largest generation. And so this wave is just, you know, this is how these waves work. And that's driving the unemployment rate, okay? And you can see it's gonna stay high, or there's gonna be a lot of you still, even though they're starting to shrink a little bit, all the way out to 2020, okay? All right, well, as high as the unemployment rate is, you can see that the youth unemployment rate in Spain is about is 55%. Okay, Italy, Portugal, Slovakia, Bulgaria, I mean, it's really high. So don't uh, take it personally. <laughs> it's true all over the world. All right, so these are very, very high when you look at other places. All right, and unemployment rate by educational attainment. Okay, less than high school, 11%. This is nationwide, 2013. High school diploma, seven and a half. Some college, seven. Associate's degree, that's city college, 5.4. Then when bachelor's degree and up, then it starts to really fall. So education is very important, as you can see. High school, this doesn't cut it. All right. The future of the workforce. Not as many workers are just simply needed anymore. I showed you all the investment in software and technology and equipment. Right? But employees can be a lot more discerning of who they hire. Why? Because they'll have a robot do what you do. In the last six, seven years, technology is really taking over. Now robots are doing it all. Okay, anything, any job that's mundane, repetitive, that you can code with software, can be done by a robot, microprocessors. Okay, there was a study done last September at Oxford University said 47% of all jobs in the U.S. could actually be automated over the next 20 years. 47%. It's a lot. Transportation and logistics industry, office and admin. We already see an office and admin. I mean, you call up any business, you get a live person. No, it's all automated. Right? It's annoying as hell, but it's automated. It didn't used to be that way 10 years ago. It's all happened the last 10 years. Production and assembly. Here, I'm going to show you some examples of that. 21st century, this is how you need to make yourself indispensable going forward. Okay, 20th century jobs demand creativity, innovation, problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking, outside the box thinking, technical skills, analytical skills, you need math, science, entrepreneurialism. You need all these skills now for the jobs of the future because everything else is codifiable. We done with software. So the big question is, are robots eliminating jobs now? Okay. And, the, and, and, and so there was this, uh, our, this is a debate on the internet, will robots lead to high unemployment rates? They already have. They already have, now it's not 75% clearly, but it's contributing to the higher unemployment rates. Why is it so much higher this cycle? So much higher, demographics, robots. Here, here's a Nissan plant in uh, Japan. Industrial robots, they're fastening, welding, all the stuff on the bodies. This used to be all people. Not anymore. It's just been replaced in the last 10 years. So this is a whole team of people. Okay? Golden Gate Bridge, toll plaza. People were here taking money. They pulled them all out. It's been automated for one year now. Okay? 28 jobs lost. It's all automated. Don't need them anymore. Here's a robot restaurant. That actually is the name of it in China. They got 20 robots and four people. The robots greet you outside, they bring you in, they sit you down, they take your order, they go back to the kitchen, they cook the food. I could show you some pictures, I got a bunch of pictures up. They got these robots, they're cooking your noodles and rice. Then they bring you the bill. They clear your plate, clear your ticket. 
robot restaurant. They cost thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars. These robots, and you plug them, in, and then they work for five hours. Then they need a break because you, you need to plug them in to, to recharge them for two hours. Then they work another five. Then they work another five. They work all day long. They don't need any overtime pay. They don't need any pay. <laughs> you buy them once and you've got them. You just have to maintain them. Here, Amazon drone. Have you seen this? You seen this thing? Where have you seen it? Here. You're going to see it right here. Ready? Okay. This guy has an iPad. He's at the Amazon site. He's buying this stupid little tool. <laughs> All right? So, I mean, okay, so, he's, so this is an example of what this drone is. He's buying this stupid little tool. Okay. So, normally if you've been on Amazon, you normally have the last two buttons. Add to cart and add to wish list. But now there's another button to demonstrate the, zone, the, the drone. I want 30 minute delivery. Okay? So this guy, in all of his impatience, chooses that to buy the tool. So they're at the warehouse fulfillment center, the warehouse, the Amazon warehouse, okay, in Chicago or wherever. Puts it on a conveyor belt in a little box. Drone grabs it. This was just announced, by the way, by uh, what's his name, Be Jeff Bezos of Amazon, in, uh, in November. There you go, there it goes. Drops it. Guy comes out, and uh, he's got his, his Amazon thing, 30 minutes. Pretty cool, huh? See now the quite now why do I why did I show you this? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> why did I show you this? Yeah, look how many jobs that replaced. Look how many did. Look, it got rid of all the UPS drivers and post office people that would take it from the factory to the to the, your town and then from your town to the, your house or to your business. I mean, and the, you, you all the loading and unloading. I mean. God, it probably replaced, replaced hundreds of jobs. And then if you had like thousands of these drones, it replaced thousands. That's the technology that we've got going. In fact, we're probably four or five years from delivery. Clearly we can do it now, but we have to deal with the compliance and regulatory issues because the FAA, FAA doesn't want 10,000 of these in the airspace all at once. So it's got to deal with that. Okay, so these are already operational in the United Kingdom. They deliver pizzas. This way. China and in Australia, they're going to be delivering textbooks. PG&E has replaced 1,200 electrical meters every day last year with digital ones. So they don't have to send a guy out to your house to read your meter anymore. They just read it from the office. Here, PG&E has downsized their reading department. Big time, 50 to 6. Okay, Applebee's. You know Applebee's is the largest restaurant chain in the U.S.? Yeah. 1,865 locations, We're putting tablets on every table by the end of 2014. Okay, tablet will take your order and your payment. No waiting for the waitress to come. No check, no waiting for the check. You just do it all right there at the tablet. But all they do is deliver the food. You don't have to tip. Okay, here, this is Atlas. It's a robot, six, two, 330 pounds. These were initially, Put into place to go into these uh, disaster areas like that uh, nuclear plant that uh, kind of self-destructed in Japan a couple of years ago, right? So they sent those robots in to look for survivors or to pull out any kind of important stuff that they needed. They're to send people in. Okay? Now they've made them so that uh, they can actually be a, a full-scale full army. That's good. They're stronger, more resilient, more accurate. Yeah, transformers. <laughs> Okay, developed by DOD Pro. So the Atlas, I mean, they can shoot a lot more accurately. They don't shake. 
So that's what we got going. So you can see technology is taking over everything. And, and that's what, and so microprocessors is in everything. We've eliminated a lot of the jobs. And employment rate's much higher now. All over the world because of it. Okay. Here, let me keep going on because I don't have much time left. Index of industrial production continues to rise very sharply upward. And uh, I guess uh, all the utilities, all the transportation, all the manufacturing, all kind of condensed into one index has been rising. So we've been seeing this expand in the U.S. Kind of important number causes GDP growth to increase. Okay, here is the ISM Institute of Supply Management Manufacturing Index for the U.S. Anything above 50 <laughs> is an expansion of the manufacturing sector. It's been expanding, as you can see, regularly. Okay, that's up through March. Durable goods orders, I talked about that. There's refrigerators, all big appliances, includes cars, all that stuff. Big ticket items, those orders have been going higher and higher because consumers are have been buying and purchasing. So it's an important indicator of the US economy as well. It's been arising. Okay. Have you guys seen these indicators before? All right, so here they are in, in, uh, in practice. Come on, let's go. Index of leading indicators, which is a composite. I'll show you the list of them, but you can see it's been rising. In fact, it's been increasing kind of exponentially in the last six, seven months. So it's really rising, a lot, taking a lot of its cue from the stock market. Okay, so there it is, it's very high, which tends to suggest that we're not in for any kind of recessionary period for a while. Okay, it includes average hourly workers, uh, week, uh, hours worked, uh, unemployment insurance, uh, uh, initial applications for people applying for unemployment because they're unemployed, uh, new orders for goods, goods, speed of delivery of new merchandise from vendors, the amount of new orders of capital goods, the amount of new building permits, the S&P 500 stock index, money supply, uh, uh, the interest rate spreads, and consumer sentiment. That's what makes up the index. It's, it tends to be a leading indicator of how things are going for the next five, 10 months in the economy. Okay? That's what that is. Here's the balance of trade. It's been rising, so it's very strong. Balance of trade. What's the balance of trade? What is it? Well, let me show you what it's doing right now. It's, uh, there it is, it's sort of, it's contracting again, although it's leveling off. It had already, it had uh, gone the other way there for a while after the recession ended because of the problems in Europe. But with Europe now recovering, the balance of trade is now contracting again. Happy to see that, okay? It's the difference between, you know, our country's imports and our exports, right? C plus I plus G, and the balance of trade is X minus M. Right? X minus M. M. Exports minus imports. Okay? And that's uh, also another indicator of growth. And so uh, our X minus M is now shrinking, which means GDP is rising as a result of it. Okay? If it grows more negatively, then GDP will decline. Okay? So that's what that is. Now, when you look at, uh, say, Europe, here it is for GDP in Europe. Uh, and this is the most recent numbers. These were all negative not long ago. Now they're starting to go positive again. So the top one is Romania, then Latvia, Lithuania, Sweden, Luxembourg, Hungary, Britain, Poland, Matia, Malta, I mean, then Ireland, Portugal, Germany. So they're all positive growth. So we're seeing Europe starting to come back in the most recent reporting of GDP in Europe. So we're starting to see the world economy pick up. That's good. It's good for our balance of payments, good for our GDP growth overall. So that's helping significantly. We know that C is rising. That's consumption. Investment too. Investment in software, investment in residential structures, investment in equipment. And government spending has sort of been flat to moving downward with the budget cuts. So that's what's contributing to GDP growth in general right now. Federal funds rate, what's that? Are you talking about that? Uh, Okay, so it's the rate that the Federal Reserve controls. This is the one that they can change. Federal funds rate. Okay. It's so what banks borrow money from them for. They borrow money from the Fed at this rate. And it, what, what, why, why is it, why don't I have any data in there? See, 
How come I don't have any data from December 08 all the way until today? Huh? Because what? Because the federal funds rate is zero. There's no, it's zero. It's right there. It's there, but it's right at zero. They cut it to zero. It's been there for the last six years. Okay? There is no rate. Well, it's where it ranges between zero and a quarter point, but it's basically nothing. Here's the U.S. Treasury bond going all the way back to October 1955. Right? And here it is through on October 2nd, 2013. 2.63. I didn't bother to update it. Why? Because today's rate is 2.63. So it just would have been a straight line. Well, kind of moving up and down, but we'd be, we're at the same rate today as we were in October 2nd. So it's sort of moved laterally. That's where we are in the U.S. Treasury. Right? Very, very low rates. You can see how low they are. They're the lowest they've been in 60 years. Okay? 70 years. Wait, is that 70? No, 60 years. Long-term rates very, very low right now. Okay? What's the Fed concerned with? Inflation. Yes. Yeah, so what else? Let me think. Uh... <laughs> Come on, you can get this. I, mean, uh, I don't know. I, I don't mean, know. I'm keep my perfect record. Oh, sorry. Three out of four is not bad. The unemployment rate. Okay. Job creation. They are, but inflation is the number one issue. Yes. Bank lending, worried about that, and just general broad based improvement in the economy. But the biggest issues are the unemployment rate or job creation and inflation. That's what they're worried about. And they haven't been having to worry too much about stuff. Here's inflation. This is total headline inflation. And it's running at about 2%. Sometimes a little bit less. Okay, core core rates about the same, about 1.7 to 2, when you take out energy and food. Okay, so it's not a big deal. So inflation is very very low. All right, so that's another key indicator. So inflation's under control. Job here here. Let me see. Equity markets are rising. They're at record highs or close to them. You know, industrial production is up. It's at the high for the cycle right now. Consumer confidence is at the high for the cycle right now, okay, since the Great Recession. Automobile purchases, high for the cycle right now. Okay, employment growth, it's modest. You know, it doesn't, employment growth doesn't have to be stellar because we, we use a lot of robots. Okay, but it's been 48 months of positive job growth in general, and the unemployment rates come way down. Inflation's contained, it's less than 2%, very low. Okay, housing prices are back up again. There's not much that's not doing, that the economy is not doing good in right now. That's why when I see these surveys and the first things I show you, these people say, oh, we're still in recession or we're still bad. It's nuts. Okay, we're no longer in a recovery. We've recovered. We're now in an economic expansion cycle. This is as good as it's been in six years. Okay. Is there any likelihood of recession this year? No. Virtually no chance. The economy is an expansionary cycle. The economy would much more likely move the other way than recession. It may even be more growth than we expect. So the bigger risk is on the upside, not the downside. So look for higher interest rates as economic growth accelerates later this year. So those very, very low rates that we've seen, they're likely to go higher. Uh, growth in the general economy. So here's GDP growth. We saw 2.8% in 2012, 1.9% in 2013, and this year we're probably going to be about 3.1% and next year 3.5%. So the best years of the cycle are, are right ahead of us. This could be the best years of the economic expansion of the cycle right now, 2014, 2015, maybe even 2016. Okay? That's what I tell businesses. An employment rate, 6.7, 6.3, it'll probably hit this year, and then 5.5 .5 to 6, or more closer to full by 2016. Okay, but it would have taken many, many years to get to that point. All right, so there are no global threats, really ones that we can identify. We have a rising stock market, the world economy is coming back. We're seeing the fastest rate of growth since the end of the Great Recession right now. 
firms that continue to be on a crusade to cut costs. Robots are running everything now. Corporate profits are very high. Uh, the near-term economic outlook is, we're, we're, we're at normal now, we're at nor a normal expansion. We no longer can make any excuses for the Great Recession. And the housing market is going to continue to contribute and actually add to growth. That's why GDP growth will go a little higher this year and next, because housing, which hasn't contributed, will not start to. Okay. That's it. That's my update. Any questions? <clears throat> you challenge guys? Questions from the challenge group? Why is inflation so low? Does anyone have a question about that? I mean, quite, that was the question. Does anyone have an answer? Why is inflation so low? What, what's the number one issue for inflation? What causes inflation? What, what's the biggest pusher, push element of inflation? It's what? <laughs> Normally, wages, wages and salaries, worker costs, compensation, okay? Well, we still have lots of unemployed. We have a lot of still, a lot, a lot of slack in the labor force. The slack in the labor force doesn't give workers a lot of, uh, you know, buying power to be able to push wages higher. Where the workers aren't scarce. They're probably not gonna be scarce for a while because we've got productivity with technology replacing a lot of workers. So that keeps inflation uh, low. We've also, uh, 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 so we have a lot of technology, a lot of productivity. It keeps things, uh, uh, it keeps things going. But I tell you, uh, with uh, the economy heating up and, uh, and now we're gonna see a little more scarce uh, resources because the world economy is going to be demanding more goods and services because they're all recovering. We could be seeing some more inflation. And we're getting more inflation in health care costs, in housing costs, rents are going up, housing prices are going up. So again, scarcity, now more greater demand, the slack is, is lessening there, so you're going to see more inflation. But inflation is normally a sign that you're in an expansionary economy. So it tends to be a, a good signal to some extent as long as it's not out of control. Inflation is very, very low right now because labor costs and because we haven't reached that point where demand is really outstripping supply in a lot of areas. But it soon will be in some areas and soon you'll see higher inflation. But not runaway inflation. We don't anticipate that. Okay. Any other questions? It's almost time to go. Well, do you think it's a good solution to creating more jobs from uh, the ones that are lost in like the effort technology? You know, I don't think that, that the slowdown in job creation is a bad thing because it keeps costs contained. It keeps products cheap for you consumers, for all of us consumers. I think the issue is how do you make yourself indispensable so that you can get a job? That should be the question. Yeah. And education, getting into the right uh, occupations, technology, programming, software, healthcare, you know, the occupations that are gonna be in big demand. And all those other skills that I showed you right at the beginning, creativity, problem solving, analytical, financial, okay? Getting in, being an English major in college is not going to cut it anymore. It's communications, don't go into that. Don't do it. Everybody does. Dead end, okay? Don't go into anthropology. Don't, don't go into psychology. Don't go into sociology. You want biology. You want chemistry. You want mathematics. You want economics. You want... To be, you know, get into healthcare fields. That's what you want. Actuarialism. Those are the fields that you. That, that's what's going to be needed. Anything analytical. That's how you prepare yourself. But you, you probably already know this, but that you know that's it's a hard lesson that we're learning now. BA is no longer enough to get a job. You got to have the right BA, the right degree, the right skills. As you can see, everything's microprocessor. If a Computer can do it, it will. Okay, can't work in a car wash anymore. It's all gonna be done by robots. Okay, even agricultural workers, they now have robots that can pick lettuce and grapes. That was always the big stumbling thing. Technology interact, because those robots would crush everything. But now they're developing really fine sensors and things to pick that stuff. 
So you can see all these ag and farm workers out of jobs. It's amazing, this stuff. And this has all just happened in the last five, ten years. Make yourself indispensable in your education. That's what you have to do. Um, so, do you think that technology won't completely take over all the jobs, but some of them will still be left over? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the next hundred years. Don't know after that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, you will. There'll, there'll be lots of, you know, as long as you do the right thing, you know. Uh, you, you'll be fine. But again, you don't want to get into areas where there's no demand. And I get asked this all the time. So you want to make yourself as indispensable as possible by getting technical, analytical, problem-solving type decision-making skills. Right? That's financial, uh, software programming. Uh, software programmers, uh, you know, analytical people, uh, code, knowing code, that's going to be real important. Now, software engineers, engineering of any type, they solve problems. You know, this is just mathematicians. It's, if you don't like math, well, too bad. You're going to have to know some of it. It's important. But uh, the soft stuff, you, know, make, you may get a job, but you'll you'll be poor. You know, that's the reality. <laughs> Can you give me an idea of how you came up with your 3.1% forecast? Uh, from the, uh, the, from our moms. <laughs> I don't know if that's an answer. 